Hello, and welcome to the Global Antitrust Institute's online lecture series. I am John Yoon, and today we will be covering equilibrium. So we're gonna broadly divide today's uh, discussion into two topics. The first is uh, the determining the market equilibrium through the interaction of demand and supply. So we've developed the concept of demand and supply in prior videos. So if you need a refresher, please refer to those, but you don't have to have watched those videos to understand hopefully today's discussion on equilibrium. And after we set up the equilibrium, we're then gonna transition over to talk about welfare, which in this context, we mean how well the participants in the market, in this case, consumers and producers are doing. And so we capture that idea, at least for consumers through the consumer surplus and for producers with the idea of producer surplus. And so when we talk about the market, you know, a central part of that is really the determination of price and ultimately the role that prices play in a market economy. So taking a step back, when we talk about a market, it's really talking about two groups of participants. And I've already talked about them in the introduction here, which are the consumers and the producers. So it's really the interaction between the two that ultimately determines the price and quantity. So those are the two variables that we're interested from the interactions of the two groups. And so let's start with the consumers. And when we, when we talk about consumers, we talk about their demand for a certain product. And so we can visualize that demand or the desire for the product uh, with this graph where price here is on the y-axis and x, the x-axis is the quantity. And the relationship uh, between price and quantity for the consumers is what we call a negative relationship or an inverse relationship. Um, the demand curve is also uh, called the marginal value curve. Think of it from the perspective of a specific consumer. It, it tells you at, the, at every quantity what you're willing to pay, if you will. And so price, uh, we think of it as like the price we actually have to pay. So uh, in this case, you can replace price with a dollar sign. It's really just the scaling of the dollar and what you're willing to pay. And so here I have a, in case you missed it, here we go again, a skier going downhill to emphasize this negative relationship between price and quantity. So let's say that we start at P0 and Q0. And so again, that price and quantity, the demand curve captures uh, that combination. Let's say that price is increased to P1. Well, what's gonna happen? The quantity demanded, not demand, demand is the entire curve or the entire relationship, but uh, the quantity demanded falls to Q1. Now, how much it falls will depend on the shape of the demand curve um, and a concept we call elasticity. But for our purposes, we're just interested in the directional change. So again, as price increases, quantity is gonna decrease. Um, so again, that's an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. Now the market supply curve is gonna be uh, the same summary of price and quantity, but now from the perspective of producers. And here, instead of being a negative relationship, it's actually a positive relationship. And here, we label that the supply curve as well as the marginal cost curve. Now, marginal cost is that additional cost, the total cost, from an additional unit of output. And we covered the concept of marginal cost in our video on cost. So if you want a refresher in that, uh, please take a look at that video. And we, at the very end, explicitly derive the supply curve. But for our purposes, all we need to really know is that there's a positive relationship and that stands to reason. So just to emphasize that positive relationship now, instead of a skier, we have a hiker going uphill. And so similar to demand, let's start at a, a combination of price and quantity. Here, P0 is associated with a certain quantity supplied, Q0. Now let's increase the price to P1. And that from the supply curve shows us that um, the suppliers are gonna wanna make or sell more 
and that's going to go up to Q1. And again, that stands to reason. If you're a supplier and the price is higher, intuitively, we know that's good news for the supplier. And the question is why? Well, according to this supply curve, your costs are increasing as you make more. And so in order to compensate you for that higher cost, you need a higher price. And that's what we show here as the price increases. Now you're willing to um, supply more. And you can see that with the arrow. And again, this is the directional change. The precise amount you want to sell more of will depend on the shape of the supply curve and the supply elasticity. So cost is rising as output increases, tells us that firms need higher prices to incentivize them to devote more resources to this market. Now the interaction of the two, uh, of demand and supply when we bring them together, just like two blades of a scissor, they come together and you're not cutting anything, so that can only take us so far, but it comes together to complete the picture. And so where they intersect is where quantity demanded just equals quantity supplied. And that occurs in this graph at P zero, uh, excuse me, P star and Q star. And there we have it. That's the equilibrium price and quantity given the demand and supply conditions in this sp specific market. Now, I find that interesting in of itself, but we got it learn a little bit more to understand why that's an important price quantity combination and why hopefully you will agree that's a pretty interesting combination. So taking a little step back, what is a market? So many think, many people when we hear market, we think of it as a physical place such as a farmer's market. And that's not a horrible thing to have in your mind. That's a useful metaphor, but it, it's not really a person place or thing per se. It's a process of spontaneous coordination among suppliers and buyers. It involves real people. So it's that process that really determines quote, a market, which is that price and quantity that's ultimately sold. Now, getting to the punchline, the virtue of an equilibrium is that absent market failures, the size of the pie, the benefits to the market participants, if you will, is maximized. Again, there are two groups, buyers and sellers, and we care about how both of them are doing, right? Because we need both of their participation for there to be markets or well-functioning markets, clearly. Um, and so that benefit to them is maximized at that combination where price and quantity intersect. Now I'm gonna get at that point a little bit indirectly. Let's start with uh, a price that's too low. And that's something that's gonna be below that P star that we established previously. Notice here that price at, at that level is gonna create a wedge between quantity demanded and quantity supplied, whereas <clears throat> P star, they were equal. So in this particular case, the quantity demanded is going to be a lot higher than the quantity supplied. And the reason for that is because a low price is very attractive to buyers, whereas relatively unattractive to sellers. And so this creates what we call a shortage, right? Where the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. Now, how much is actually going to be sold with a price this low? it's gonna be the quantity supplied. The reason why is the shorter side of the market, the quantity that's less is gonna dictate how much is sold because you can't force sellers to sell uh, more than they want, even though buyers want a lot more, sellers are only willing to um, produce and bring to market QS, right? So that creates that shortage. Now a policy that could create a shortage is something we call a price ceiling. And a price ceiling is a maximum price that's set below the equilibrium price. Um, we're not gonna explicitly look at price ceilings, but that can create a situation of a shortage. And a famous episode of that was in the 1970s 
when there were gasoline price controls. And you know, often the intent is quite good, which is to not have prices increase during a, a time of crisis. And there, there are uh, sort of good sort of uh, moral reasons for that. But in terms of the actual economics, it can create uh, a situation that could be worse. So if you're that guy way back there in the car waiting to get your gasoline, um, while the, the nominal price is fairly low, the total price that you're paying in terms of your full opportunity cost of time and money, it's gonna be pretty high. So it's gonna allocate goods and services in, in a very different way. So what's gonna happen absent government controls is that if the price is just set too low, there's gonna be a pressure to increase that price. Going back to this price control, let's say the gas stations just set the price too low and they just see there's huge quantity demanded for their product. You know, they're gonna adjust and calibrate and say, um, I can make more money and actually buyers um, in some respects are better off in the sense that they don't have to wait that long and that it will be allocated to those who are willing to pay the highest price. Of course, if you're the guy first in line and you're paying the lower price, you're better off with the price control um, or with the low price. But again, um, it's going to be uh, on, on net, going to be worse off. Now, what if the price is too high? Well, in this case, you're again creating a wedge between the quantity demand and the quantity supply. But in this case, it's going to be the quantity supplied that's going to be relatively high and the quantity demanded that's gonna be relatively low. And the reason for that, again, stands to reason because when you have a high price, that's gonna be very attractive to sellers, but it's gonna be relatively unattractive to buyers. So this is gonna create a surplus. And there's a surf surplus because you can't force buyers to buy more than they want to buy, right? So they're gonna dictate how much is actually sold in this market if the price is too high, which is the opposite of when price was too low. And so this surplus uh, can be a situation where there's all this inventory that they can't sell because um, the price is too high for buyers to purchase it. Just to do a hypothetical, what if the cost of a Girl Scout cookie box was $20 instead of whatever it goes for? You know, I'm sure some will still be sold. There's definitely um, individuals who would really buy this kind of no matter what. So, um, but what we would expect is that it would be a lot of unsold inventory if, if there was a production and then they priced it at 20. The following year, they would probably adjust it and you would see a downward pressure on prices uh, as this unsold surplus is, is quite wasteful. So, uh, Opposite of a, of a price ceiling is a price floor, which means that you can't go below that price. Um, agricultural price supports is, is an example of that. Okay, so what you see is that there's gonna be this sort of, I call economic gravity that puts pressure on prices to move towards that equilibrium P star and Q star. So it's beyond just, oh, that's where they intersect. There's actually a lot of logic as to why that's where the price and quantity will end up, at least we would expect it to for a given market because there's that pressure to move to that. And so this is a decentralized level of coordination. So what this means is no one is dictating that the price is P star and Q star from a central planning office. Rather, it's buyers and sellers interacting um, and competing with each other in terms of the sellers um, and buyers looking out to purchase what is best for them that will ultimately clear the market at P star and Q star. And that's sort of the, the magic, if you will, of, of a market. Now, the importance of price just to emphasize this, this is a snapshot from Etsy. And let's say that you're looking for a, an attractive cork board of the United States. And I know that's on all our lists. And actually it is now that I've seen this. Now, how do you make your decision if you're a consumer for this type of product? Well, 
there's a lot of things, right? Does it fit the decor of your home? You look at your uh, shop rating, you look whether it's handmade, you look at the, the seller and how much sales is being made, but ultimately you're gonna look at price, right? That's gonna be the ultimate determinant of whether or not you wanna purchase this product. In a similar way, looking at some durable goods, if you're looking for an Audi Q5, you know, you're gonna to wanna to look at the features, the colors and all the great stuff that you would expect to be in the car. But the bottom line is you're gonna make your decision based on the price. And in a similar way, a home, which is a very durable good, um, it's gonna come down to price. So price is playing an enormously important role in a market. It serves as information, right? When we talked about price being too high or too low, it created all these incentives from both the buyer's and seller's perspective. And then it created these pressure, that economic gravity to move to a different price. So price again, sends signals information to producers and consumers about relative scarcity. For producers, it can be an incentive to enter or a signal to exit, right? Um, if the market is doing very poorly and uh, the price is, is really low and you can't cover your costs, it's just information to you that this isn't a very fruitful area of commerce. And um, in, in a similar vein, price coordinates activities among strangers, right? Um, something that's common uh, to, to just about everywhere here in the US, which is uh, the price uh, like gas stations, right? And you see the price of gasoline. And that price, that single price, if you will, or here are three prices, dictates a lot of economic activity. That's the decentralized coordination I talked about earlier. From the supplier side, it dictates how much is refined and uh, explored. And from the consumer side, it dictates how much you drive. Uh, now in the short run, you might not be able to change that uh, tremendously, but if price of gasoline doubles, it's gonna change your behavior. Uh, you're gonna perhaps change your, your driving patterns. You will perhaps change the type of car that you purchase. And it could ultimately determine um, where you actually live um, or even the job that you uh, are employed at, right? All those things can be influenced by the price of gasoline. Now, in moving to the second part of what I wanted to talk about, right? So uh, supply and demand gives us that equilibrium price and quantity, but supply and demand can also tell us uh, what we wanna know about how well the market participants are doing. And the way that we capture this is what we call consumer and producer surplus. Now, consumer surplus is from the perspective of buyers. And let me just define it here, which we use the acronym CS. The difference between what consumers are willing to pay, WTP, and the price they actually have to pay, in this case, the P star. And so where do we go to determine what consumers are willing to pay? That's the demand curve. And so we can represent that with this shaded uh, area, this triangle, which represents the consumer surplus. And the reason why that's the surplus is because for every quantity, it captures what consumers were willing to pay and what the price they actually had to pay. Uh, just think about your own situation. Have you ever wanted to purchase a product and actually at full price, and then you go to buy it and then you notice it's on sale. You're like, oh goodness, this is my day, right? I was willing to pay, you know, 30% more, but I'm getting this huge discount. You come home with a huge smile on your face and you're feeling great about it, right? Why? Because you gained a lot of consumer surplus, right? This is giving you a certain value or you wouldn't have purchased it. And now the price that you have to pay to obtain that is significantly lower. You've gained consumer surplus. And that's the idea here. Um, and it, it's, in this case, quite, quite large, right? Uh, uh, there are a set of consumers who are willing to pay a very high price, but they only had to pay P star. And then it gets smaller and smaller as consumers' marginal valuation declines. And we don't go further than Q star because now consumers value it less than the price that they actually have to pay. And so they don't purchase any. So there'd be no consumer surplus. It would be negative if they had to be forced to buy it. Let's move to the supplier's perspective. And that 
is a very similar idea, but we now label it producer surplus or PS. The difference between the price received, that's the P star, and the price suppliers are willing to sell it at, the opportunity cost. And what concept captures what they're willing to sell it at? That is the supply curve. And so the shaded area now is uh, the, the difference between the price that sellers receive and what they were willing to supply it at. Um, and this is just the opposite. Put yourself in the perspective of a supplier. And let's say that um, you know, it only costs you $2 to produce and someone's willing to pay um, you know, $20 for whatever product you've made. There's a huge degree of surplus that's available to you from that market price and you gain enormously. But notice as you produce more, your, your costs are increasing and that's reflected in the upward sloping supply curve. So your producer surplus is getting smaller and smaller until it's basically zero. And you don't wanna produce more than Q star because now your costs are higher than the price you receive. And if you were forced to sell that, then you would be gaining negative uh, producer surplus in this case. Now, a question that you might have is that is producer surplus the same as economic profit? And it's close, it's not bad intuition. And it might be under certain conditions, but it's not precisely the same concept. Um, profit is uh, the difference between your total revenue, the benefit from making something, minus the total cost, obviously the resources required for you to make that product. This graph actually shows us total revenue in this market. That's is a very you know, useful model. You see P star and Q star. Well, total revenue is just the product of those two things. And so that, that's, that rectangle uh, of P star and Q star represents the actual level or the total revenue. So we have one side of the equation. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but we don't have the full other side, that's total cost, because total cost is a summation of two cost concepts. That's a variable cost and fixed cost. So we have variable cost with the supply curve because it's capturing the marginal cost curve. And marginal cost is really a change in total cost, which is a change in variable cost because it's the only cost that changes without. It. Fixed cost is not represented on this graph, so we don't have it. So there is a relationship between price uh, for producer surplus and profit, um, but we don't fully see it here. But it's, it's kind of close enough. It's capturing that same idea, if you will, in terms of how the producers are doing. So the summation of the consumer surplus and the producer surplus gives us what we call the total gains from trade. And that's really the value of the market existing. So if someone asked you, well, what's cereal, breakfast cereal worth to the US economy? It almost you're like, whoa, that's a big picture kind of question. Uh, I think a reasonable starting point is, well, you're like, well, how much is sold and what's the average price and the index of the price of all the cereals? And that gives us an estimate. And it's not bad. It's not like you would be totally off, but that's a complete overestimate, if you will, because that's just total revenue. The relevant concept is the gains from trade, which is the consumer and the producer surplus. And so that's the true valuation of a market. Now, um, going back to the virtues of equilibrium, one of the slides I showed was that P star and Q star isn't just where they intersect, but also where the, the pi is maximized. And this is explicitly showing you that idea here. You cannot find any other price quantity combination that would give you uh, more gains from trade, which is the total blue and yellow areas in this graph. It's a pretty powerful result, right? So this decentralized decision-making results in this pi being maximized. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. And not just because it's about pies, which is really a very delicious and elegant dessert. Okay, maybe not so elegant. Cake is probably more elegant than pies. Pie's a little more sloppy, but more delicious. Um, now, finally, I, I want to play with the graph a little bit. And it's really a powerful framework and, and you can do a lot with it and we've already done a lot, but you can do more. Let's say that the demand for a certain product, let's say hand sanitizer, 
during the winter months shifts out. What does this tell us? Well, according to this framework, our prediction is that it's gonna result in a higher equilibrium price, uh, P prime, and a higher quantity, Q prime. Again, how much more and higher price and how much more uh, higher output will depend on the shapes of the demand and supply curve, but directionally, that's what we would predict. And that's a pretty nice result, right? Um, and what's even further interesting, even though I didn't show it, is that the uh, welfare of the consumers and producers will change with that shift. You can compare the before and after and see which ones uh, is higher. And that's what's so powerful about this framework is that you can do a variety of things with it. And um, hopefully today gave you some insight into that process. Thanks so much.